Okay, afternoon everyone. Um, my name is Matt Smead and this is my colleague um, Katie Dodsworth. Um, so we are from Robertson Cooper. Um, we are going to take you through a session for the next half hour or so on the power of positivity. Hopefully that will all become clear as we go through. So um, just before we jump into it, um, you've probably heard this a million times before about who we are, but kind of worth reiterating for myself, if nothing else. Yeah. Um, so we are, me and Katie, we're both business psychologists. We work in our delivery team at Robertson Cooper. Um, we specialise in um, improving the psychological well-being of employees in a range of different organisations. So we work with public sector organisations, the NHS, police forces, but right through to large private sector organisations as well. And it's all about, um, part of it is about this idea of positivity um, and some of the models that we're going to take you through today. Um, but part of it is really about how do we get, the, get the, that extra edge from ourselves, um, from the people who work with us, and also as leaders, how do we have a positive impact on the culture of well-being around us as well. Um, so we're going to take a particular focus because we can't go through everything that we do today, although I'd love to, unless you've got a couple of hours. No? No. no. Cancel the meeting. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll shorten it down. We'll focus on this area of strengths and positive emotions and how you can have a real positive impact for yourself and for others and hopefully leave you with some quite practical techniques and places to go after the, after the session as well. So hopefully it'll be interesting as we go through. Okay. okay. So we are psychologists, so we love a good few models and theories. So we start with yeah. actually why we're talking about positivity. How many people here have come across the term positive psychology? Yeah? Mm, good, we've got quite a few start. in the room. Um, so for the benefit of those of you that haven't, positive psychology really stemmed out of um, the fact that as human beings, we naturally tend to gravitate towards what's wrong with us and how can we fix it. Um, and as HR professionals, a lot of what we do relates around that. So performance management, um, monitoring absence, all that sort of thing. We tend to look at what's going wrong and how we can fix that. Um, and positive psychology is really about trying to flip that around. Um, and it's based on the notion that actually um, the scientific study of what goes right can teach us an awful lot. Um, and the research around this suggests that actually it's an awful lot more easy um, and effective to build on what we're already good at and what's already going well. So thinking about when times are good and what we can learn from those rather than thinking about fixing the problems. And that leads on to strengths theory. So strengths theory comes out of positive psychology and it's clear to see why. Strengths is about focusing on what are we good at. But it's not just what we're good at in terms of our strength versus our development need, a skill that we've acquired. A strength in strength theory and positive psychology is about what really energises us. So it's something that we're probably good at, but because we love it, it gives us energy, it brings out the best in us. So if you imagine candidates for a sales role, you may have two very inexperienced new candidates, haven't done sales before. If you've got one who naturally loves talking to people, building connections, it what gives them a buzz, um, naturally very results orientated and closing that deal gives them a real kick. Although neither of them may have the skill sets at that point, that individual who really loves that is likely to be better eventually because they'll be building on what they're naturally tuned towards. And so that's what strengths are all about. Yeah, um, so the link to psychological well-being and what we really focus on at Robertson Cooper is then using those strengths to achieve these two things here, a balance, balance between these two things. So this is, this is how we define psychological well-being. Um, we don't, don't define well-being be, define well as, as yoga and massages and all stuff like that, although it is, I guess, important. It can improve your psychological well-being. But at the absolute heart of it, what we're trying to achieve are these two things. So um, the first thing is, is at the top really important around this positive sense of purpose. So people coming to work every single day and feeling that they really connect with what they do, you know, they feel that the, what they're doing is worthwhile and um, difficult sometimes, challenging um, quite a lot of the time, but achievable. And when they do achieve, reach that sense of achievement, use their strengths to be able to do that, then they, they get that real sense of purpose that comes with it. Um, but just as importantly, and this is probably even closer, um, more closely linked to strengths, is this what we call, psychologists call, the effective state. All we really mean there is the positive emotions that people experience on an everyday basis. So how inspired, excited, determined, enthusiastic they are to do a great job. Um, I heard it, um, has anyone come across the work of Paul Dolan by any chance? Um, wrote a book called Happiness by Design. He describes it really well as this idea that we are essentially pleasure or purpose machines. His language, not, his language, not mine. And that for, for individuals, we have kind of preferences in this area. Some of us are very driven by that sense of purpose. 
that's what matters to us most. Whereas other, others um, are more kind of hedonic. It's all about what, what can I do that will bring a smile to my face and make me happy in the moment. Um, and there's lots of different things in our kind of everyday lives that bring a different balance between these two things. So for example, if you're in the pub with your friends, having a drink, you know, just kind of chilling out, it's probably more, more focused on that affective state. You're probably doing it to make yourself happy and content and because you enjoy doing it. Have you got a real sense of purpose associated with that? Per with that? Maybe, maybe not, unless you really like drinking, I'm not too sure. Um, but then you have other things in your life that bring that real sense of purpose, but not so much the happiness sometimes. So um, one example I heard um, uh, is of kind of reading a story to your child for the hundredth time. I don't know if anyone has to do that. Um, so, you know, not particularly unpleasant a job, but what, the reason that you're doing it is because it comes with a real sense of purpose. You're not particularly reading that story and thinking, this is the most exciting thing I've ever done this day. Um, but it will have a real sense of purpose with it. And that's what we're trying to do, achieve these two things um, for individuals, that will help you to flourish over time, but for organisations, having employees who are getting these two things um, can help unlock a whole raft of business benefits as well, which we, we won't go into now, but, but we have shown through our research. Okay. So just hopefully you have them, but just in case you have forgotten what a positive emotion at work looks like, we thought we'd share <laughs> a few yeah. with you. Um, and just to get you to do some of the work as well, just... Briefly, just in a couple of minutes, just turn to other people on your table and just start to think about when was the last time that you feel you really had the opportunity to bring out these emotions quite strongly at work? What was it that you were doing um, and what sort of skills, attributes, qualities of your own do you think you were drawing on at the time? The chances are what you're starting to talk about, hopefully, um, is what we describe as being in the flow. Um, it can also be termed as being in the zone. And these are the situations at work that really allow us to bring out our natural strengths. It's when we're using our natural strengths and they're eliciting those emotions. They're also likely to be eliciting that sense of purpose. The Matt talked about, so it's unlikely, it may be the case, but it's unlikely that some of those examples you were just sharing um, were totally meaningless. There's likely to have been a goal, and that's what absorbed you, allowed you to really use your strengths and bring them, and then for elicit these types um, of emotions in the workplace. And this concept of flow um, is really important because when you look at that link towards the positive emotions and the sense of purpose, that's when we can be operating within this positive well-being. That's, it's kind of when we feel happiest um, at the best in what we're doing. Sadly, we can't be like that all the time, and that's why we want to talk about actually using um, strengths to help encourage those sorts of situations. Um, and this is a model that we use um, a lot with the clients that we work with and a lot with the work that, that we do, whether it's in training or in coaching, this idea of pressure and performance and, and thinking about how do I actually get myself into that, into that zone of flow, you know, in the zone and the, in that zone of um, positive psychological well-being at the top of the curve there. Um, and one way of thinking about it is harnessing pressure for yourself, so harnessing positive pressure for yourself and for others using this sort of analogy here. So you can't see it so well on the left-hand side. I'll just run you through it. So the idea with this analogy is that you've got pressure, which is increasing along the bottom axis there. So that can be pressure from anywhere. It can be workplace pressures. It can be um, pressures associated with how much control you have over your role, um, your work-life balance, um, pressures that come from perhaps even your relationships with people at work, all pushing you towards the right-hand side. Um, and then this is performance up the left-hand side. And what it does is it leaves us with these three quite distinct zones that we see people operating within. So in the middle, we've got our positive psychological well-being zone, the green zone at the top there. That's where we want everybody to be for the majority of the time. We want them to be feeling happy, healthy, making the most of their, their strengths, and they're at the top there. Um, and you'll see that there's not a complete lack of pressure, actually, with that psychological well-being zone. Um, and we all need a certain amount of pressure, as I'm sure you all know, to kind of get us out of bed in the morning. You know, if you think about a time when you were best at work, you know, feeling at your absolute best, like your discussion just then, probably wasn't a time when you were rushed off your feet trying to keep up. Probably wasn't a time um, when you were perhaps becoming a little bit bored or disengaged, if that ever, ever happens, surely not. Um, it was probably a time when you had a lot on, you were relatively busy and challenged, um, but you were able to rise to those challenges and therefore you're at the top of the, top of the, um, the curve there and performing at your highest level. The problem does come when we see people coming into this area on the right or the left-hand side of the curve. So 
On the right hand side of the curve, you probably heard this term, if not come across this a number of you. So this is our burnout zone. Um, so the burnout zone is basically where pressure has exceeded your ability to cope. Um, as a result of that, if you're spending too long in that zone on the right hand side, it will start to affect um, your performance, but also your health as well. And again, I could tell you lots of different links between psychological well-being and pressure and how it can impact on physical health. Um, and if left unchecked over time, that can become stress as well. Um, just one really quick word um, on the word stress, because um, I come across this a lot. Um, I come across a lot of people who say to me that they work best when they're stressed when they're under stress. I would categorically say that that is never the case. I would say that people work best when they're challenged and when they're pressured and they can rise to that challenge. When they become stressed, when they become burnt out, that's always a negative thing. And whilst you might be able to keep yourself up in the um, performing to a high level for a little bit of time on that right hand side, it's just not sustainable over time and it will start to impact your performance. Um, and then just quickly on this left hand side as well, we've got our other zone, rust out. And don't worry, we're not going to ask you today if you, you're burning out or rusting out. Um, but the rust out zone is probably, I see, one or two main ways. So number one, it can be the complete opposite of burnout. It can be where, um, again, if this ever happens, you have a complete lack of pressure. You go to work and there is literally nothing on. Um, we, sometimes, yeah, maybe that doesn't happen. Sometimes you use the analogy of, um, you know, imagine yourself sat on a beach with a glass of wine, you know, the sun's on your back and it's all lovely, you know, that'd be great for a day, it'd be great for a week. Would it be great for a month or a year? Or, uh, yeah, people are still like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah five years, <laughs> ten years, yeah, that'll be fine. You get the idea there. You know, we do need a certain amount of, <laughs> amount of pressure to motivate us and bring us up that curve. Um, probably more common though on that left hand side though um, is not a complete lack of pressure and boredom but actually that lack of sense of purpose that I talked about before. So sometimes you have people on that left hand side of the curve who they are still busy. So they're still busy, they're working long hours, they're getting through quite a lot of stuff but they're not particularly energised by what they're doing. They're not particularly challenged perhaps by what they're doing. They've done it a thousand times before and they start to go through the motions. So they may seem like they're engaged because they're working long hours and, and whatever it may be, but they're not really performing to their highest level because they're not really challenged, engaged by what they're doing and actually using their, using their strengths effectively on that left hand side. Um, and this is, a, this is a, an, another model when we're talking, uh, yeah, we love a good model at Robertson Cooper, as you can see. This one links to a practical tool, which I'll, I'll tell you about in a second. <laughs> um, so this is, this is around how do you keep yourself at the top of that curve? Um, and a huge part of that is around this idea of being resilient. Um, so the idea of resilience is that almost it's inevitable that we will find ourselves on the right or the left-hand side of that curve from time to time. You know, I've, I, you know, we do hundreds of these training courses and I've never come across anyone who puts their hand up and says, oh, I just cruise through life at the top of that curve and everything's always perfectly balanced. We will have times when we're on the burnout zone um, or perhaps rusting out on the left-hand side. So resilience is about how do we utilize our strengths to keep ourselves up at, the, up at the top of that curve. If we're burning out, how do we draw ourselves back? If we are at risk of rust out, how do we energize and challenge ourselves up the curve? And that's the link to resilience here. So this is a four-part model, not particularly easier to read from where you are. Um, but this is a four-part model that we've, we've developed at Robertson Cooper called the I resilience model of personal resilience. It basically shows the four key areas that people tend to draw on when we're talking about their personal resilience. So just quickly running through these so at the top, some people have a high level of self-confidence. So that includes things like high levels of self-esteem, they're very positive people, um, optimistic perhaps. They've also got high levels of self-competence as well, which basically means they think they're good at what they do. Not always the case, <laughs> always, but, but they at least have that kind of self-belief that comes along with it. Sometimes hear that top person referred to as the blagger. You ever come across that person? You know, it doesn't need any forewarning, just uses their confidence to deal with pressure. Sure, there's no blaggers in the room, maybe. Um, on the left-hand side, we've got purposefulness. I talked quite a lot about this. So some people naturally draw, have a real strong sense of purpose. They know what their values are. They know what really matters to them. Um, and they know what's really important to them. And what that helps when we're, we're thinking about resilience is um, that the world doesn't end 100 times a day. You know, when you get that email and suddenly it, you know, it doesn't collapse that person's world because they know what's really important to them so they can put it into perspective. 
Also, it allows those individuals to have a real clear sense of drive and direction and goals. So these people know where they want to get to so they can use their resilience to stay on track and not get knocked off, um, knocked off track along the way. Um, just very quickly, adaptability at the bottom. Some people are very adaptable, great at flexing their approach in different situations. And um, unlike that blagger, they don't just use one approach to get through every single difficulty. They say, they almost survey the landscape and say, right, what's the best way of dealing with this pressurized situation? And they use that approach to get through it. And then finally, social support. And often actually underutilized that area of social support. We, we ask people, the, we've got a questionnaire, I'll tell you about in a second, but we've got a questionnaire which measures these four areas and, and where people tend to draw, draw their resilience from. And social support is always the least utilized one for some reason. So people tend to say that they'd rather be confident or adaptable or have that sense of purpose than rely on the help of others. Um, whereas when we're talking in a training context, development context, actually that one on the right hand side is one of the, the easier ones to build over time. You know, it's quite difficult to, to take someone who lacks confidence and change the way that they look at the world. It's quite difficult to create that sense of purpose and values for someone who, who doesn't find that as easy. Picking the phone up to your friends and family more often, you know, keeping those, that network um, going over time, building that network, um, can be an easier thing to do. And, and, that, and what we're talking about there is in terms of quantity, the, the sheer number of people you can rely on, but also quality. So having those two or three people um, who you know, if everything goes wrong, if you're really struggling to cope, they're the people you can draw on. And when we talk about the power of positivity in terms of building resilience, it's not just about kind of happy thoughts. It's a little bit more and deeper than that. Um, and as you can see here, hopefully, is that you can actually use strengths and an awareness of your strengths to build your own resilience. And if you're working with others who are having a hard time dealing with a particular situation or a change, actually using strengths as an approach to coaching and supporting others to build their resilience. So there's just a few suggestions around here. So um, link very much to the confidence. That confidence is self-belief. We don't spend an awful lot of time actually thinking about what our strengths are. It's not something, it's particularly not very British um, to talk about what we're good at. But to spend time thinking about your own strengths or if it's for someone else to work with them to help them really understand what are their personal qualities, what sets them apart, can help build that inner confidence that they have to get through the more challenging times. Um, linked to purposefulness, as Matt said, some people can very readily engage with what their purpose is in life, what drives them. Again, for others, it might not be something that they've necessarily thought of particularly. But working with someone to really look about what are their underlying beliefs, values in life, um, why are they there? Why did they choose to do what they're doing? Because there is always a choice to something. Um, to help them reconnect with that, to give them back that sense of purpose, um, if that's kind of gone a bit astray during a challenging time. Um, and similarly, adaptability, as we talked about at the beginning, a strength can be underused. So a strength is something that we've got the potential to be great at, maybe not necessarily great at the moment. And our environment can really shape as I'm sure you're aware, the behaviours and the habits that we've formed over time. So the chances are the situation changed, but as humans we tend to respond in the same way um, if we're not naturally adaptable in that way. And starting to help people think about perhaps what strengths they've got um, that are underlying, haven't come to the front in the environment they have been, that they could draw on to think about a situation differently. So you can use techniques like that to reframe a problem. This is what you did do, but what else could you do? What other attributes, characteristics? What have you done in different situations? What have you seen other people do that you think you could um, at also, you'd like to be like that, um, to reframe that situation? And finally, Matt mentioned the social support has been massively underused. And actually, you can understand what strengths you've got in that. So what interpersonal strengths do you have that you could use? This lack of wanting, this unwillingness to ask for help. Often the flip side to that is people who get a real sense of pleasure from helping others. Mm. Helping people makes us feel good and if we remind ourselves of that, either helping others through change can build our confidence and our purposefulness and so help in other areas of resilience or it can maybe give us the confidence, maybe asking for help is not the worst thing in the world because it might actually make someone else um, feel that they're contributing to be assisting me in that situation. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and just on that, quickly before, Sorry. Um, yeah, uh, if you're particularly interested in that, and this isn't a sales pitch, I promise, because it's free, so that doesn't <laughs> count, right? Um, if you're particularly interested in finding out more about where you may dra draw your resilience from, um, we've got this tool called iResilience, the model that I've just pointed out before. It's available completely free, what's that strap line? Free for everyone forever um, on the website. And it allows you to fill in a personality questionnaire. Um, it's a slight test of your resilience doing that because it's 180 questions long, but I promise it's worth it when you get through it because you get this report back and it will show you where your natural strengths and any potential risks lie in those four areas that we mentioned here. It's a really good starting point that for you to use for yourself and for other people as well. And my one caveat before I move on would be with a strength session, please, 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 when you get this back, it's got strengths and risks in it, please read the strengths first. There's <laughs> so many to, sessions that I run where everyone just gets their report and they go, right, what's wrong with me? Tell me what's wrong with me and what I need to fix. So um, with the kind of idea of strengths, what are your real core strengths in these four areas here and how do you build on those over time? Because that's where your most effective, um, effective change will come from. Okay? Should I'm conscious of uh, for time, so you might do the LI stuff. Yeah, that might yeah. be more useful, actually. Yeah. If anyone's particularly interested in using these positive emotions through change, then grab us afterwards, we'll be on the stand. But yeah, just conscious of change, this bit's probably... Mm -hmm. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, so, so we thought we'd skim through um, a couple more models to arrive at our final model. <laughs> <laughs> there's a theme, there's a theme Maybe to this. Maybe a little bit aspirational, <laughs> quite how many. There's a theme to this. Um, uh, so this is what's called our leadership impact model. So I've talked about high resilience, which is all about you as an individual, how you cope with pressure. There's another big piece here, which is around how do you utilise your strengths as a leader, as a manager, to have a positive impact on those around you, be them your direct reports, be they your peers, um, or be it the organisational culture that you create around yourself, or even as a, a leadership team. Um, and we've broken it down into this four-part model, which actually relates back to the pressure performance curve that I showed before. Um, so when, you, um, when we work with people um, based on that personality questionnaire, they usually fall into one or more of these different leadership styles or leadership types up here. We've got two which are called um, our challenge-led styles. And back to the pressure performance curve, these are the styles that help to bring people up the curve to motivate them when they're at risk of, of rust out. And we've got two what we call support-led styles. So those are the styles which come in particular, um, they're particularly useful when you've got people who are at risk of burnout or being too pressured. How do you support them to bring them back, back down the curve, as it were? Um, and we've got these four different styles as they break out. Um, we've, I'm going to ask you in a second to think about which style you may, might be. So I'll quickly run through these and just think which one might be you. So at top left, we've got our first challenge-led style. That's challenge pace. That is a leader who has a real preference for a fast-moving environment, as it says there. They're flexible, they're adaptable to change. These are all of the strengths associated with this particular style. Often leads to a real kind of creative and innovative environment as well. And I would say with the challenge pace-led style, and with all of these different styles actually, um, there is a slight risk in terms of overusing strengths or, or taking things to the extreme. So what we're talking about here is um, challenge pace driven leader, great if, it, if you need to bring that, that pace and inject that, that enthusiasm and, and keep things moving at a fast pace. However, if that's the only style that you rely upon at any given time or throughout the year, um, it can become change for change's sake. Basically, you're running 100 miles an hour and everybody else is trying to catch up with you. Um, asked to oh, sorry. <laughs> Very quickly, challenge results focus, someone who's really focused on results, the goals, they know what they want get to get from um, the team um, and what their, their final goal is. Um, our cooperative leader is someone who has more of a focus on collaborative working, team working, getting other people on board. And then finally, our confidence leader. That's someone, it's not the blagger, it's just someone who has a real confidence in their own ability and the ability of their employees. So they're probably great delegators and they've got great trust in their employees as well. And so we've not got time to ask you which style you might be, but I would um, kind of recommend that you think about this afterwards. Just have a look at those four styles there. Um, it links into another report that we've got, so if you wanted to ask us about it, feel free. Um, but thinking about what do you think your natural style might be as a manager, as a leader, um, across these four, um, and once you've got that, how, first off, how are you going to use the strengths associated with that style? But secondly, how are you going to make sure that you actually get balance over time? So if you're that pace-driven leader, like that enthusiasm, how do you get those strengths, make the most of the things that you're good at, um, but also balance it with that level of support so that you're mitigating any, any risks that come with that as well. Okay. Okay.
So hopefully you've really captured the, the power of the positivity is really about drawing on what we're already good at to make a difference. As Matt's alluded to, we've got a couple of tools which can help you understand your own strengths and those of others. So as we said, the eye resilience um, is available free for anyone, anytime. Um, if you're interested in the leadership impact and knowing more about your style and how that can impact, actually, although that one isn't freely available, um, we're ha it's the same questionnaire that you complete to get the report. Um, so if you complete the eye resilience, if you come over to our stand and let us know um, your contact details, we can invite you to do the eye resilience and f we can then send you um, the leadership impact report as well as you've been able to download your eye resilience report. Okay. Have we got time for questions? Or? No. Absolutely Sorry, not. we yeah. will be around if Our we've got questions. Our strength is obviously not timekeeping. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been an absolute No, pleasure. it's much more enthusiasm and passion for this stuff. <laughs> yeah. so. okay. okay. Thank you very Thank much. You.